Hey, Chris, how are you? What's up? I, I didn't even get a chance to spit out a hot take, Jim. Before you hung My up. man, you can now. You can now. You got all the time in the world. What's going on? How you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good, good, good. All right, so you've written, uh, there are two words that are going to haunt the Celtics and their fans in the last few rounds, and those two words are third quarter. They were not a bad third quarter team the regular season, but, Chris, against Milwaukee, Miami, and in the first two games against Golden State, they have had some disasters. What's going on? How do you explain that? It's really hard to explain because it's a relatively new phenomena for this Celtics team. Um, like you said, uh, regular season, they were plus 2.7 in the third quarter. Playoffs, they were minus 0. 0.8, which is bad, but not catastrophically bad. But they have just had some absolute disasters over these last few rounds. Game three against Milwaukee. Game one against Miami. And the last two games of the series where they just had the doors blown off them in the third quarter. Now, now Golden State is a great third quarter team. The numbers reflect that. But the Celtics, after playing the Warriors like nip and tuck for the first two quarters of both games, should not be getting just annihilated in this quarter. And look, I I don't know that there's a X's and O's answer to it. I think in in a way it's just a mindset that you come out with. You've got to be as prepared from the opening minute as your opponent is. The Celtics haven't been that way. I mean, if I'm Ime Udoka, I I almost think outside the box a little bit, like – all right, we go back to the locker room, and instead of talking about the first half, we, you know, watch CeeLo Green in the halftime show. Like, I don't know. Like, something different. <laughs> something has to change, you know, dramatically for these Celtics because they can't keep playing catch-up uh, against Golden State. They did it in the first, uh, in game one, behind ridiculous performances by Al Horford and Derek White. They weren't able to do it in game two, and... Uh, I don't know they're going to be able to do it much the rest of the series. Chris Mannix is joining us. All right, Chris, so in terms of mindset, I mean, sometimes a team will win game one on the road, and then they'll show up the following game like they're happy to get that split and just happy to get that split. Did you sense any of that happening with the Celtics last night? No, because you can usually see that early on. And I think Boston had something like a nine-point lead in the first quarter. They came out aggressive. Jalen Brown was making shots. Um, the defense looked locked in. They, they looked like they were coming to get two games out of this series. And really, all throughout the first half, they were connected. It was only a two-point game at halftime. And then just the third quarter, I mean, I don't want to keep repeating myself, they just let their, their, the foot up, took their foot off the gas in that third quarter and allowed Steph Curry to wriggle loose and have a great third, 14 points, play great defense in that third. I thought Draymond's energy was a big factor in this game. They moved him on to Jalen Brown uh, during Game 2, and, and he was great in that capacity. Uh, the Celtics have to find a way to match that energy. Simple as that. Now, you can say, and you might be justified in saying, that you know, they go home, they have the home crowd behind him. It's going to be rabid in Boston for Games 3 and 4, but they have to make sure they channel that because Golden State, even on the road, is going to play with a high level, level of energy in this series. We're talking to Chris Mannix. You actually mentioned a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Draymond Green coming out with the kind of energy and aggression that he did. Also, Steph getting off the way he did. Let me ask you this. If you're Steve Kerr, how concerned are you about the fact that Clay Thompson got loose in Game 5 of the Conference Finals, but since then, Chris, he's 10 of 33, including 4 of 15 from deep. Is it something that can change over the course of the series, or is this just where he is right now in his comeback? Yeah, this is where he is. Jim, I, I think if you leave Clay alone for standalone jump shots, he's still going to make them like the old Clay Thompson. Um, if you ask him to do a lot more, he's just not going to be able to do it. I mean, I, it, it's not to say he will never be able to do it again, but he is just several months into a comeback from two major injuries. It's asking a lot for a player to be able to move like he once did, defend like he once did and shoot kind of out, anything outside of stand-up jump shots like he once did. I was talking to people in Dallas about this, and, and they were saying a lot of the same things, like Clay's still dangerous when left alone, but if you ask him to play off the dribble, if you ask him to defend quicker guys, he just can't do it right now. So I think you know, the, if you're Steve Kerr, you've got to find ways to, to open up Clay for those standalone jump shots because otherwise 
it's just going to be really difficult for him to have big nights. Chris Mannix is joining us. Uh, Chris, Boston does not necessarily need Marcus Smart to go for 18 the way he did in Game 1. And it might not be fair, for instance, to expect 26 from Al Horford every night, right? But how do you explain their combined four points last night? Yeah, I, I can't. I mean, Marcus missed a lot of shots, um, and, and that's that's something that he has to work on because he was open for some of those shots. And if you left open, you got to make them. Golden State... Their defense, um, it, it just, they're going to leave you open. They're going to leave some guys open. It's the way their defense is kind of built, where they scramble around, pay a lot of attention to Jason Tatum. Somebody's going to be open. And when you're Marcus Smart and Al Horford, if you're open, you've got to take some shots. But Al Horford got frustrated a lot in game two. He had a lot of point blank shots. He just missed. Like he was three feet, four feet from the basket, and he was just missing off the side of the rim. And I thought that kind of roller coastered a little bit for him. And by the fourth quarter, you know, it was it was it was garbage time for everybody out there. But both those guys, they don't have, to your point. They don't have to score twenty, but they've got to score like twelve to fifteen. They've got to be efficient doing it. They've got to be low turnover. That's the big thing we haven't talked about. Nineteen turnovers was a disaster for Boston. Eleven live ball turnovers, meaning they turned the ball over in the open floor, and that led to points for Golden State. Thirty three points for Golden State to be exact. I mean, that can't happen. And we can talk adjustments, Jim, and a lot of ways basketball is about that. It's about the nuances of it. But if you commit 19 turnovers and your opponent gets 33 points off them, you're not going to win many games. It's as simple as that. So that's the big number the Celtics have to clean up going into game three. Don't keep, don't turn the ball over quite as much. Chris Mannix, my guest, you're right. We had not talked about that, but I was going to talk about that. I want to emphasize that point. 19 turnovers leading to 33 points. Boston allowed 10 points off turnovers only in game one. So on, on some level, Chris, I feel like whoever turns the ball over less is going to win. Let me ask you this. You recently had a conversation with Danny Ainge about this Celtics team and their road to the finals. What did you take away from that conversation about how he built this team and what he saw in some players that maybe others did not see? Well, he saw a lot because a lot of the moves he made, the draft picks he made, were not no-brainers. I mean, we look at Jason Tatum now, and we might forget that Markel Fultz was the home run pick back in the 2017 draft. A year before, Jalen Brown, his pick was actually booed at TD Garden by fans that wanted Providence's Chris Dunn to be the Celtics draft pick that year. So Danny made some unpopular choices during his time as GM, but I think Danny saw, in a way, the evolution of the game. And when I say by that, I mean kind of emphasizing long, lengthy, multi-position types of players who can all shoot. I mean, they drafted Grant Williams, and Grant was not a great shooter when he was at Tennessee, but the Celtic staff, they thought they saw a great shooter in Grant Williams. He's turned out to be that type of guy. Um, you know, you look at the Tatum, Brown, guys like that they've drafted. These are all guys that play multiple positions and who can shoot the basketball. And that's something that's become a premium in today's NBA. And I think Danny recognized that early. Now, Danny was great, but this team definitely needs Brad Stevens, too. I, I, to my, I'll take to my grave, Jim, that Danny doesn't make the trade to get Al Horford because you have to include a first-round pick. Danny doesn't make the trade to get Derek White because you included a first-round pick and swap rights down the line. So these were moves that Brad Stevens made that I don't think Danny Ainge would have, and that's a big reason why the Celtics are in the finals, too. Really interesting. Chris Mannix joining us. So before you go, Chris, really quickly then, where does that leave Utah? Ainge, of course, no longer with Boston. He's with Utah Jazz now. The Jazz announced yesterday Quinn Snyder is stepping down. What is your sense as to what's happening in Utah right now? Is it just about a change at head coach, or are there more changes coming? Uh, well, I think there could be more changes coming. Um, I think Quinn Snyder believed that he had taken this team as far as he could. I think he believed, in a way, he wasn't getting through to Donovan Mitchell in the same way he was getting through to him before, and he realized this was the right time to walk away. I think Danny Ainge, and this is just speculation on my part, but if there's overwhelming offers for both Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert, I think Danny Ainge takes them. I think he understands that this Jazz team is not a championship team. And Mike Conley is getting a little bit older. And right now you have a chance with both Gobert and Mitchell in the prime of their careers under long-term contracts, you might be able to get the kind of haul that the Celtics got for Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Rajon Rondo, the core of that team moving forward. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, 
But if there are teams out there like the Knicks, the Warriors, the Raptors, that might be very interested in the players the Jazz have, if they're willing to throw young talent and swap rights and draft picks into a trade, I think the Jazz will, will strongly consider them. So, Chris, is one quick follow before I let you go. Where do you come out on Quinn Snyder as a head coach? Do you think that he's one of those masterminds, one of the best in the league, or maybe not so? Where do you come out on him? I think he's a very good coach. It sure sounds like Charlotte is too far along to really consider Quinn Snyder for that job, but he'll probably take a year off and he'll be back. There's been a lot of people connecting him to San Antonio if Greg Popovich retires after a year. And I've heard Oklahoma City mentioned as a possible landing spot if they decide to make a coaching change after next year. So I think Quinn takes a year off, but he will be a desired commodity whenever he decides to get back into coaching again. He is a senior writer for SI, the NBA analyst for NBC Sports Boston, boxing analyst for the Zone. Got a couple of great podcasts as well and a very, very good friend of the program. He is Chris Mannix. Chris, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It was great. Anytime, Jim.